السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا وحبيبنا وقدوتنا وإمامنا محمد بن عبد الله الهاشمي القرشي صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most gracious most merciful All praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created not only every single one of us but entire creation. And not only created us but has provided for us in every single way and is in absolute control of every single aspect of not only our lives but the lives of everything he has created. All praise is due to him. And all praise is due to all the messengers who were sent to us to remind us, to remind mankind of what is right and what is wrong. Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all his companions. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the ulama of this ummah and every single one of us who are seated here and all our offspring, the ummah at large. May Allah grant us goodness, contentment, happiness, barakah in absolutely all our aspects of life. May He protect us from evil and grant us every form of goodness. This evening I have selected a topic that affects every one of us. Every one of us has needs. We all have needs in life. Allah has created us in a way that we depend on Him totally, absolutely. Not for a split moment can we say that we don't depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the very beginning to the very end and even after what we may know as the end. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down to us, as we've heard moments ago, I said, messengers to remove us from the darkness to the light. Messengers to remind us of the way to success. These are the messengers who were sent by the one who created us. We were never placed here by coincidence. No. We are here carefully planned by Allah. Divine planning, divine wisdom. He knows why I was made. A question I like to ask. Where was I? Say for example, if I am 30 years old, for example. Where was I 34, 35 years ago? If you are 50 years old, where were you 51 years ago? It's a question. You must answer it. You must answer it. And for those whose lives are going to be 70 years, where are you going to be at 71? Where? Answer the question. It's important. You won't be able to answer that question without the Creator having informed you. There's no other way you would know. Never. So there are some people, مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحِيَا Some people say this life is just the life of the dunya. We will die, we are alive, that's it. There's nothing more than life and death. It stops there, it started when we were born, uh, coincidentally, and it will end when we die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, nay, that is wrong. Completely wrong. So the question is, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created me, He made me helpless. I needed assistance from the moment I was born. Beautifully, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَحْنُ قَدَّرْنَا بَيْنَكُمُ الْمَوْتَ Beautiful verses of Surah Al-Waqi'ah. Allah says, Do you see the reproductive seed that is produced by you? Who made it? You or we? Who created that reproductive seed? How did you come into existence? That little embryo, the fetus, as it developed, who gave it eyes and a nose and a mouth 
And when you were born, who inflated your lungs at the point of birth? I am alive here, sitting, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inflated my lungs and yours at the point of birth. And that is why you take that breath and people begin to cry. Shaitan becomes jealous of one more life that is going to worship Allah or that there is a possibility of that life worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So out of jealousy, shaitan pricks man according to the hadith and that is why we cry at birth. That's the hadith. The reason why we cry at birth is shaitan pricks you. So you cry when you are born. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the devil, from shaitan. And at that point, there is a qareen, the devil. Every individual has one devil with that individual. With that with The devil will not leave the individual until the point of death, trying to lead that person astray. May Allah safeguard us. So we were helpless at that point. And then what happened is, we were blessed with parents who looked after us. That's a topic on its own. And they nurtured us, they brought us up, they looked after us, they clothed us, they gave us, they gave us whatever drink and food we needed by the will of Allah. In the case of those who were orphaned, there were others whom Allah created to do that. That is why we are sitting here today. If we were dumped at that young, tender infancy, we wouldn't be here today, we would probably have been dead. So it's Allah's fadl, Allah's virtue. He chooses people to look after others. Then when we grow up, we tend to forget that hand that protected us. And that's a topic on its own, as I say. But as you grow up, initially you don't realize that you need this and you need that. Why? Because Allah fulfills your needs through somebody else. When a child is born, the child doesn't know what the child needs. But those around the child knows what the child needs. So the milk is provided, the nappies are changed, the child is made to go to sleep. Why? Because those around are the ones who are interested in fulfilling the needs of the child by Allah's plan. The child never made dua to Allah at that age. No. But those who are looking after the child will make dua. Ya Allah, make it easy for us. Ya Allah, this child, protect it, give it good health. Let's think of this. Who made the dua? The ones who looked after us. Then when you get to a certain age, you first want a toy, I think. I'm just giving an example. Then nobody brings you that toy. So you make a dua. First duas in our lives. Have you ever asked yourself, what was the first dua I made in my life? I think most of us can't remember. And maybe the earliest memories might date back to a toy that we asked for. Ya Allah, I need this, you know. You know, these Legos, they're out here. It's so good, Ya Allah, give this to me, man. Somehow, Ya Allah, I heard that I need to make dua to you, Ya Allah. This is something that is practical. Why? Because that is the dua of a child. A child is asking for that. There are children who make much more sophisticated duas. But I am talking of the general norm. First dua. It's not a very important dua. But we, it is made passionately. That's my topic this evening. Dua. Calling out to Allah. We are all in need of Allah. That's how I started. We are in desperate need of Allah. How does Allah fulfill our needs? We ask Him. Imagine, it is Allah's plan. That is why the hadith says, Mallam yas'alillaha yaghdab alayhi. Whoever does not ask Allah, Allah gets angry with him. Because Allah has created me and you in a way that we have to ask Him. By Someone asking you for something, what are they doing? They are automatically acknowledging that you have the thing they want. Automatically. So if someone tells you, brother, I need 50 rands. They think that you have more than that. So that's why they are asking you. Would you go to a beggar who has nothing and tell him, give me 50 rands? Nobody would dare do that. Because that is foolish. So when we say, Ya Allah, give me good health. What are we doing? We are worshipping Allah. By acknowledging that he controls my health. Subhanallah. That is why the hadith says, Addu'a'u huwa al-ibadah. Dua in essence is worship. And the one narration says, Addu'a'u mukhu al-ibadah. Dua is the core and the essence of worship. 
Because when you are making dua to Allah, then you are asking Allah for something, acknowledging He has it. Ya Allah, give me sustenance, sustain me, grant me barakah in my sustenance. By saying that, you are automatically worshipping Allah by acknowledging He controls barakah and He controls your sustenance and mine. So that is Allah, that is His power, that is His might. This is why it's important for us to know that we need to call out to Allah day and night. Absolutely every day and every night, so many times in the day and the night. This is why when we read Salah, what is the essence of Salah? There is something within Salah that is called Salah. In Salah, there is Salah. What does that mean? Salah as we know it is the five prayers that we pray on a daily basis or we are meant to be praying on a daily basis. But there is a surah that is repeated in every rak'ah of salah that is also called as-salah. One of the names of surah al-fatiha is as-salah. And in that surah we make a dua. Have you ever thought of what surah al-fatiha is? It is nothing more than a dua to Allah. After acknowledging his status, we make one dua. Surah Al-Fatiha has only one dua in it. What is the dua? Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. That's it. That's the dua. That whole surah rotates around one thing. We are praising Allah. We are declaring his greatness. We are glorifying Allah in order to ask him to guide us. That's it. So for me and you to know, if I were to ask you, what is the most important dua ever that can be made? The answer is, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide me to the straight path. If you have guidance, you don't need food or drink. Because if you die, you will get absolutely everything. But if you don't have guidance and you have food and drink in the world, believe me, that is doom. Allah protect us. I hope you understand the depth of what I'm saying. I am not at all saying that we don't need food and drink. But I'm saying we need guidance more desperately than we need food and drink. This is why the ulama have always considered their own scholars who taught them as being more important than food and drink. Hajatuna lil ulama'i ashaddu min hajatina lil ta'ami wa sharab. Our need for ilm, for knowledge and for ulama and to benefit from them is much greater than the need we have for food and drink. Some people's lives rotate around earning in order to eat luxuriously. There is no harm with that unless it is done at the stake of Islamic knowledge and at the stake of the respect and the benefit from ulama and of the ulama. So as we develop and we grow, we begin to make du'as. When we are 10 years old, we are supposed to be reading salah. But not the salah of a lot of people today who just pay lip service to that salah without even thinking what they've said. Do you know, I'm sure you've heard this from ulama, when you say in salah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. That's a simple translation. Allah says to his angels, My worshipper has praised me. Hamidani abdi. Allah responds to that portion of Surah Al-Fatiha. And when we say the next part of the verse, or the next verse, Allah responds again. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Most gracious, most merciful. Allah says, again, my worshipper has declared my greatness. Maliki yawmiddin. Owner of the day of judgment. Allah responds again. My worshipper has glorified me. Also declaration of greatness and also part of praise. Different types. Then we iya kan abudu wa iya kan astain. You alone, listen to this. You alone we worship. You alone 
we seek help from. What is that? That's dua that we're talking about. You alone we seek help from. When we ask someone to do something that Allah has given them the capacity to do, we ask them, but over and above that, we will say, Ya Allah, make it easy for them to give me what I'm asking for. For example, you want, let me use a simple example. You want someone to pass you the food that is on the other side of the table. You say, brother or sister, please pass me that ketchup that is on that side of the table. You're allowed to do that. That doesn't mean you made dua to them. You ask them to do what you know Allah has given them the capacity to do. But you know if Allah wants to stop them, they might have a heart attack before they pass it to you. Or their hand might freeze paralyzed before they can give it to you. Or the bottle will drop before it comes to you. Anything can happen. So bottom line is we know Allah is in charge and in control completely. So that is why when we say, brother, please, can you pass me that we at least in our hearts and minds need to acknowledge and declare that it's only through Allah's permission that this will happen. So ultimately we're asking Allah, but Allah makes a means to give things to us. When you say, Ya Allah, grant me sustenance. He will create people who will come to your business in order to buy from you. That's what happens. So Allah provided, but through people. This is why... Your business partners are never meant to be respected above the respect of Allah. Never. A lot of people have, a, have an error, mistake that is being made. When someone employs you, the allegiance to the employer is never above the allegiance to Allah. When the employer is doing something wrong, you need to be able to be a person who can openly say, brother, you are doing wrong. This is unacceptable. If they fire you, Allah has employed you. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. That sustenance was always from Allah. Allah created a situation just to watch you to see how you would react. When your business partner who's supplying you goods for so many years decides to engage in some haram activity and you raise and highlight it with him and thereafter he becomes angry and cuts your supply, Allah will open the pipeline for you from a, a manner that you never dreamt of on condition that you did it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is Allah. He is in charge. He's in control. Now, as we grow, a lot of things we ask for. One of them is guidance. And that is the most important dua. Sadly, a lot of us don't realize that we ask for guidance. I was saying in salah, when we make this dua, we are meant to be thinking of what dua we are making. We are meant to be understanding Surah Al-Fatiha. We are meant to be pausing after every ayah and trying to know that Allah is responding and He's so happy. When we say, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een, Allah says, Hada bayni wa bayna abdi wa li abdi ma sa'al. This is between myself and my worshipper and now I will give my worshipper whatever he wants. That's what Allah says. Then we say, Ihdina as-sirat al-mustaqeem. Guide me, Ya Allah, to the straight path. Sirat al-ladhina an'amta alayhim. The path of those whom you have favored. Allahu Akbar. What is the meaning of an'amta alayhim? It is so broad that it includes every aspect of goodness that can ever exist. The path of those whom you have favored. If someone says, let me do you a favor, will they slap you? They won't. If someone says, let me do you a favor, you think they'll steal from you? You think they'll harm you? They'll make you sick? No. So Allah says, this is a dua in the Quran we are supposed to be making to Allah. He taught us the wording. He says, the path of those whom you have favored, whom you did good to, you gave them sustenance, you gave them good health, you gave them wealth, you gave them contentment, you gave them all forms of goodness. Subhanallah. Good children, good offspring, everything worked out for them. Those are the people we are asking you, Ya Allah, to give us that path that will lead us to those type of favors, subhanallah. And from this, we learn that you can only get the favors of Allah if you are on the right path. Otherwise, you make dua till your hairs turn yellow. You will not get anything if Allah does not wish. Because Allah says... إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطُ mustaqim Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored. The, the, the biggest favoring is the fact that they are on that path. May Allah put us on that path. Once you are on that path, 
all the favors of Allah are upon you because you are on that path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us on that path. When something negative comes in your direction, you will perceive it as a positive because you know you're on the right path. This is why a mu'min is never ever depressed. Never. Because they're not upset with Allah's, in, with Allah's plan for them. We are the only people who follow a deen that teaches that to accept and surrender to taqdeer and to predestiny and fate is part of the completion of your iman. We are the only ones. No other deen teaches that. So the minute we know that and we surrender to it, then you find, may Allah protect us, a leg is amputated. You thank Allah. Ya Allah, I, I thank you so much. At least you gave me that leg for 25 years, Ya Allah. Alhamdulillah. That is the attitude of a mu'min. Your teeth disappear at the age of 50. Allah grant us good teeth. You thank Allah. Ya Allah, you gave me good teeth. I chewed so much with it. Did, I hope we thanked Allah whilst we were chewing. We read the dua before and after meals. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that for us and to us. Not only that, we are so fortunate we have the era of dentures and far beyond dentures. We need to thank Allah for that as well. Imagine, there was a time many, many years back when they probably didn't have anything. Look at elephants, according to what I was told or what we seen, studied. They die at a certain age because they can't chew no more. Nobody's created dentures for elephants. May Allah grant us all goodness. So that is the most powerful dua. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim the path of those whom you have favored. Not the path of those who have earned your anger, nor the path of those who have gone astray. Do we realize what this means? Subhanallah. Ya Allah, protect us from the other paths. That will lead us towards your anger so we won't get any gifts of yours and we will not be considered gifted people. And those who earned your anger, Ya Allah, your punishment has descended upon them, is descending upon them and shall descend upon them. We do not want to be like that. Look at how powerful the dua is. It was easy for us to say, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Stop there and say, Allahu Akbar, carry on. But Allah does not allow that. He wants to teach us how to make a dua. When you make a dua, Ask for what you want and ask Allah oh, what type of goodness you want, who it was given to prior to you. Ask Him using the example of those and then tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, protect me from the other side of it, those who have been harmed. Now let me give you lesson number one. It's for myself more than yourselves. When we are making a dua, we say, Ya Allah, grant us sustenance. And Ya Allah, protect us from those who have been granted sustenance, whose sustenance led to their destruction. And Ya Allah, protect us from those who have not been granted by you. Look at how we've already covered one aspect. Then we say, and Ya Allah, grant us sustenance, like you have sustained Ibrahim alayhi salam, like you have sustained the other Salihin, like you have sustained so and so, so and so. Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam made a powerful dua. MashaAllah. What was his dua? Subhanallah. I need to make mention of this. It is too powerful. He says, Rabbi Ghfirli. He started off by saying, Oh Allah, forgive me. MashaAllah. Why? We need to learn another lesson from this. When you want to ask someone something, clean your slate with them. Clean your slate. You can't ask a man who you almost shot dead, for example. You had a gun, you cocked it. You wanted to kill him, then you put it down and you said, Hey brother, I need a lift. I want to go from here to, you know, to, to maybe Cape Town. He'll tell you what you're talking about. You just had a gun, now you wanted to kill me. Where am I going to give you a lift? We know that common sense. But we are foolish because with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't read salah, we don't cover our hair, we don't dress properly, we hardly do anything that is right. Then we say, Ya Allah, I'm sick, Ya Allah, give me good health, Ya Allah. Take a look at how we laughed when I, made ex uh, when I made mention of that example of the man who wants to give a lift. Now when we're talking of how we operate with Allah, what is it? We should be laughing in the same way. We are fools. How can we ask Allah when we are on the wrong page? That's why to start your dua, Rabbi ghfirli, oh Allah forgive me, I'm a criminal. Ya Allah, what I've done is totally wrong. And we are taught a beautiful dua. Astaghfiruka lima la a'lamu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, Ya Allah, I seek your forgiveness 
for those sins I don't even know I've committed. Either I've forgotten about them. Well, that wasn't the case in the, in, in the Prophet ﷺ's case. But with us, forgotten about them. Or sometimes we commit sins without even knowing that this is a sin. Because it is rampant in society. Like backbiting. We backbite day and night. And gossip and slander. And, and deceive and become jealous of. And this, these are sins that have become so rife. That good people engage in them not knowing or forgetting momentarily that this is a sin. Then at night they say, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, my children, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, me, Ya Allah, grant me this and that. But whole day we were on the other side. We were in a pub, spiritual nightclub. Allah protect us. When I say nightclub, I'm saying we might not have been physically in a nightclub, but from a spiritual point of view, the sins were even worse than that. Then we ask Allah. So we learn this from many verses in the Quran. I just seized the opportunity mentioning what Sulaiman alayhi salam said in his one of the most powerful du'as ever to be made. Ever to be made. He says, Rabbi ghfirni, oh Allah forgive me. Wahabli mulkan la yanbaghi li ahadim min ba'di. Subhanallah. You know, it raises my hair before I even translate this verse. He says, Oh Allah, forgive me and grant me mulk. Mulk meaning kingdom. You know what's the meaning of kingdom? It includes sustenance with authority. Subhanallah. One is you say, Allah, give me the millions and the billions. MashaAllah, you get it. Allah grant us all forms of sustenance that is good for us. I mean. But the other is that with authority. With authority. Above that, mulkan. Ya Allah, give me kingdom. That nobody besides me, nobody after me will get. That's one of the translations of this. Mulkan la yambaghi li ahadim min ba'di. That will not be deserved by anyone after me. Grant me mulk. And Allah gave that to him. How? We know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the highest. The highest. But in certain aspects, Allah gave others certain items. Certain items. Like Sulaiman alayhi salatu was salam, he made this dua, Oh Allah, forgive me, grant me sustenance, sustain me. La yambaghi li ahadim min ba'di. In a way that others after me will not get. Allah says, فَسَخَّرْنَا لَهُ الْرِيحَ تَجْرِي amri. One of the gifts that Allah is making mention of. And there are thousands, if not millions, that Allah gave Sulaiman alayhi salatu was salam. Allah says, we gave him control over the wind that used to move according to his instruction. Subhanallah. Imagine, Sulaiman alayhi salatu was salam, we would need him here in PE, the windiest city in the world. MashaAllah, one of them. Allah says, we gave him the command. He told the wind, wherever and however he wanted the wind to blow. And whenever. And people would use the wind as a mode of transport. Subhanallah. Go to Sulaiman alayhi salam and tell him I need to get to Cape Town. This is just an example. And he would just instruct the wind. The wind would carry you there, next thing you would land. Allahu Akbar. Forget about SA045. MashaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Even that movement through the wind, it's the qudra of Allah. But Allah says we, there are some we gave them. We gave them. Why? They knew how to make the dua. And they were on the right page. So that brings the answer to us. How many of us want our du'as to be accepted? All of us. Every one of us. Correct? Correct. So, what is the secret? There's no secret. It's open. It's our fault. We don't want to follow. The example, Allah has taught us how to make du'a. He told us what to do. He told us, then when you get what you were deserving, you should know it's from us. And if we didn't give you directly what you asked for, you should know it was not for you, it was not good for you. Allah says, if it was good for you, we would always have given it to you. It is better for you sometimes not to get what you think you want. That's Allah. And that is Kamal ad dua The completeness of knowing how to make dua is to know that if I'm not given this, it's better for me. Then when you don't get it, surrender to that. That's where we fail. People come and say, but you know, I've been making dua and I'm going to say something practical. Practical meaning it's happening on the ground. I've been making dua 
That Ya Allah, whatever is best, let it happen. Now I think a lot of us do, do, do make that dua. But now it's not happening. That's what, you see the last part of the statement. I've been making dua that Ya Allah, whatever is best, let it happen. But it's not happening. Do you notice something? If you analyze that statement, the last part of it does not fit with the first part of it. Because if you are making dua to Allah to do what is best, how can you say but after that? He is already doing what is best. You are not getting it. That is best. Understand the message. Understand what it is. You are not getting it. That's better for you. Our weakness, we say, I am making dua to Allah to give me what is best, but He's not giving me. So it's like us saying, Ya Allah, I know what is best. Astaghfirullah. I hope you are following what I am saying. It's quite deep. You need to be following to understand. That is the weakness of our boys, our girls, our men, our women. Allah grant us goodness. Imagine when we say, Ya Allah grant us goodness. If Allah knows that a million rands in our pockets won't be goodness for us, He won't give it to us. But He knows that that's not goodness for us. Sometimes a person might have wealth and that might lead him to become an arrogant person. That wealth might come with a lot of bala. Let me give you an example. I was reading on the internet the lotteries of the globe. The winners of the biggest lotteries of the world have almost all been destroyed socially. Almost totally. What does that mean? You find a person winning in Great Britain, five million pounds. Hey, big amount. Next thing, for some funny reason, the wife leaves him. The children are gone. The parents don't want to know. There's a big war and the man is alone or he becomes an alcoholic. His life is destroyed. Why? Allah shows us that if you acquire something in a haram way, it can never be good for you. No matter what. Come what may, long term it is going to destroy you. Even if you were excited the day you got it. Allah protect us. So it's important for us to know the qudra of Allah. Qudra meaning the power of Allah. We make dua to Him. Where are we going wrong? A lot of the times we don't engage in istighfar before we ask Allah. Every time you ask Allah, make sure before the dua you ask for forgiveness. Another thing, we forget to send salutations and blessings upon Muhammad sallallahu the teacher, the trainer, the one who was sent to us, through whom we know all this goodness. It is a sunnah to start a dua, meaning we are taught to start a dua, at least with some form of blessings upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bismillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. That's how we start. In the name of Allah. Complete blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ya Allah, forgive me. Another mistake we make when we are making du'a, we forget to praise Allah. We get straight to the du'a. You know, raise your hands. Ya Allah, I need to pass my examination. Rahmatik ya rahman rahimin, and we go in for the exam. What is that? Who are you, who are you talking to here? Allahu Akbar. Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. Just as you entering the hall. You want to write your matrik, mashallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for those who are writing their exams at the moment to pass those exams. I mean. Mashallah, I heard that I mean was quite loud. I think we must be in the midst of those exams. But you don't just say, Ya Allah, give me good results. And then next thing, come Dhuhr Salah, we didn't read. Fajr, we didn't get up. <laughs> Asur, we... Still Allah's mercy might give it to us because he wants to show us his power. But we didn't deserve it. But let me tell you, the mistake we made is we never praised Allah. How do you praise Allah? Firstly, by fulfilling His instruction, His commands. Like I said, you are on a wrong page altogether and you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you have distanced yourself from Him. The hadith says, Man atani yamshi ataytuhu This hadith is a long hadith. Whoever comes towards me walking, I come towards him rushing. Who is saying this? My creator and yours. He says, you want to come towards me walking. I will come towards you rushing. Then there's another narration. Ta'arraf ilallahi firrakha'i ya'rifka fi shiddati. Get close to Allah at times of ease. And Allah will come to your assistance at times of difficulty. Without even you asking. Nothing. If you are at salah, you make dua every day for goodness. When, you, when there's nothing wrong in your life. A lot of us, we make dua when something bad happens to us. 
that we don't realize, make dua when nothing bad is happening, nothing bad. Don't wait for it in order to make a dua. وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ فَذُو دُعَاءٍ عَرِيضٍ Allah describes man, that when evil comes in his direction, he makes broad du'as. Broad meaning, you don't mind standing, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, give me, you know, an hour has passed and you're still depending on how big the crisis is. And you're making du'a and du'a. And five days before that, when the imam took five minutes longer in salah, we were the ones who complained, hey, look at this guy. Allah made a situation when, where we've got to make a du'a for two hours after that. Because we know, hey, subhanallah, now I'm in a problem. So Allah is telling us, when you don't have a problem, worship Allah properly. Ask Him, thank Him for what He's given you. When you are thankful, Allah says, I will grant you increase. I will grant you increase. Thank Allah. You know, you give a beggar, I'm giving you an example of the kaf. You throw or you give a beggar, 50 cents or 20 cents or say 5 cents 5 cent coin you know the copper you put it in his hand and he says ah thank you very much you know you don't know how much this is going to help me i really appreciate it god bless you sometimes you might hear a decent beggar if he says that you say hang on hang on take out five rands put it in his hand do you agree with me because you're so happy hey this man is appreciating five cents i was about to throw that away a lot of us don't even know that it's it's there not at all we, we won't even acknowledge the change. Some of the shops won't even give it to you. Allah accept. Allah grant us goodness. We need to do hisab to the T. But some people don't. So that's an example of the dunya. Come to Allah, the dini example. To Allah, whatever He's given us. Do you know what He says? Ya ibadi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh my worshippers, if every single one of you had to ask me, Whatever he wanted, and I were to give every one of you from the beginning of creation right to the end of creation, every single thing they wanted, it would not take away, it would not mean anything to me, it wouldn't take away or displace what I own besides the displacement of a pin when dropped into the water, into the ocean. You know, when you drop a pin into the ocean, how much water does it displace? Almost nil. In fact, nil. Allah says, if I were to give from the beginning of creation to the end of creation, absolutely everything they ever wanted, it wouldn't displace anything from what I have. Where's the five cent example I gave? Five cents to us still means a bit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all forms of goodness. Protect us from all forms of evil. So the mistake we make here, when we make dua, we only make dua when we are in need. Why? Why? Do we say, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ We are in need of that at all times. But we need to constantly ask Allah, Ya Allah, you blessed me with children. Ya Allah, keep them on the path. Ya Allah, keep me on the path. Even if we think we are on the path, inshallah, we should be. May Allah, make it easy for us. Ya Allah, protect me from shaitan. Even if you think shaitan didn't come to you on that day. Ya Allah, help me to identify shaitan. Ya Allah, Help me to identify good people, distinguish between good and bad, stay far away from bad. So now sometimes even those you were mixing with, whom you thought nothing was wrong with, Allah will create something between you and them through the barakah of your dua that you made. Because they were bad company. If not for you, let me explain to you for who. Maybe Allah knows this man is good, but his children might not be good for your children. So by the time your children are growing up a little bit, he creates a wedge between you and that man, not because he is bad, but to save your kids through the barakah of your dua. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So you think, hey, I don't know, this man, I was so good with him. What happened? You know, I, I really said, don't hurt your heart. If you are right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is a problem due to something that, that is deeny, something that is explainable and appreciated and acknowledged and accepted in the Sharia, ah, then what are you worried about? What are you worried about? Allah created that. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in tattakullaha yaja'al lakum furqana O you who believe, if you are going to be conscious of Allah, He will give you the power to distinguish between right and wrong, between good and bad, between that which is beneficial and that which is detrimental. Furqan, criterion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that ability. So, 
there is one other point that I had made mention of, and that is that we need to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even when we think wrongly that we don't need to. When I say wrongly, I mean we're wrong. Make dua always. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an example of all the prophets. Who are the prophets? They were assisted directly by Allah, by a revelation, direct. And they knew they were prophets sent by Allah. Imagine when you are the chief immigration officer. Just, I'm giving you an example of the dunya because that's important. Allah says, in, even in the Quran, that examples help people to think. So, if you are chief immigration officer or you're the head, head of police, how do you feel? You feel you're above everybody, isn't it? You feel, hey, I'm employed by the government. You're a president. You think, hey, I'm top here, you know? There's nothing that can go wrong here. I can dish out instructions and commands, do what I want, so on. Subhanallah. When it came to the prophets of Allah, they knew who they were. Higher than any president or any officer or any whatever we've mentioned and far higher. There's no even example. The example is totally not even fitting. However, they cried to Allah. Look what Allah says in the Quran. Allah is giving us the story. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. Allah says, you know, Ayyub alayhi salam called out to us. He cried. For what? For his needs. وَزَكَرِيَّا إِذْ نَادَى Do you know that Zakaria alayhi salam also called out? He, do you know when he called out? This is what he said. And Allah gives the story there. Allah says, so many different examples. وَنُوحًا إِذْ نَادَى Nuh alayhi salam called out. Allahu Akbar. They all called out. Then Allah says, about all the prophets, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا That's how you make a dua. Allah says, they, referring to all the prophets, they used to make haste in good deeds. They used to make haste when it came to goodness. They were always found in the forefront. يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ Whenever there was khairat, which means goodness, they used to compete with one another. Or musara'a could only mean as well, not necessarily competition, but to get there, to do something, to achieve, to be the best when it comes to khairat and goodness. وَيَدْعُونَنَا And they all used to call out to us. رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا Having hope and fear at the same time. Hope of what? Hope of all goodness. Fear of what? Fear of all evil. They had hope in Allah and they feared the punishment of Allah. They hoped in the mercy of Allah, feared the punishment of Allah. So every one of us, we need to make haste when it comes to good deeds. Believe me, if you increase your good deeds on a daily basis, even by a millimeter, on a daily basis, and you find yourself heading towards Allah, becoming a better person as the days pass, Allah will give you one of the biggest gifts after your hidayah. It's part and parcel of hidayah and guidance. And that is contentment. Allah will keep you happy. Happy. You might not have more than 500 grand a month in terms of salary. But you will be smiling every day, all day. You will be in the masjid. You will be content with what you have. Why? You are coming closer to Allah as the days are passing. Wallahi. He is the one who made me and he made you. He created us. He has written for us our provision. لَن تَمُوتَ اِعْلَمْ أَنَّ نَفْسًا لَن تَمُوتَ حَتَّى تَسْتَكْمِلَ رِزْقَهَا You should know that no soul will taste death until it receives its full due of sustenance. Full. If Allah has written one more egg for you, you will eat it, then you will die. Don't worry. It is yours. Nobody's going to take it from you. I'm giving you this example. So we need to make sure that we ask Allah. We are grateful. We are thankful. We are on the right page. We constantly call out. And we are good Muslimin. We constantly engage in istighfar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever he asked Allah, he was granted. He was granted. Granted his duas. There might be one or two that are mentioned where Allah says, this one I won't give you. There are a few examples. But that's for other reasons. Not because he didn't deserve it. And those were du'as made for others. Not necessarily for him. 
But he used to engage in istighfar between 70 and 100 times a day and even more. Did he have any sins? Did he have any sins? The answer is no. He used to read salah at night. He didn't need to. Nafil, I'm talking of voluntary for him. Voluntary salah. And his wife, Aisha radiallahu anha, used to watch his feet swell. Swell in salah. She asked a question, O Messenger of Allah. O Messenger of Allah. You are forgiven completely. No sin. You are the owner of the key. Meaning the first one who is going to enter Jannah. You are the first one whose grave will be opened. And you are the first one who is going to be resurrected. You are reading Salah. Your legs have swollen up. Your feet are gone so, you know, full of veins and so on. How? He says, Ya Aisha. أَفَلَا أَكُونَ عَبْدًا shakura." Shouldn't I be thankful to Allah? He gave me all this. Can't I thank Him, Ya Allah? Subhanallah. Look at that. That will be one of my topics in this trip, inshallah. A topic of gratitude. Very important. Very, very important. It comes hand in hand. But imagine, then after that tahajjud, when He raised His hands, what do you think Allah did? What do you think Allah, do you think Allah would have told him subhanahu wa ta'ala that nah, we're not giving you what you're asking for? Subhanallah. Now let's make mention of some of the blessed times of dua. Someone might ask, what's the best time to make dua? Every single moment. Repeat your dua and repeat it and repeat it and never lose hope. Constantly continue, make the dua again and again and again and repeat it on a daily basis and have hope and have yaqeen. It might come to you 40 years later, but it will come. Subhanallah. That's the secret. The prophets of Allah. These examples I'm giving you are from the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam directly. The prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ayyub alayhi salam made dua for how long? He was given. Nuh alayhi salam made dua for how long? He was given. Zakaria alayhi salam made dua for how long? He was given. Ya'qub alayhi salam lost his child for a while. He almost 40 years according to one narration. He made dua, he never lost hope. He cried, not because he was upset with Allah's instruction, but out of the sorrow he felt for his son Yusuf alayhi salam and later on bin Yamin. But he was given. And he says, أَعْلَمُ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ I know from Allah that which you don't know. He constantly made the dua. When his sons told him, hey, you're thinking about Yusuf. That's history. That one you can forget about. And Allah says, nay, we will give you, we know what's going on. That's a beautiful surah where Allah parallels both the life of the father and the life of the son in the same surah together with one another. What's happening on this side, what's happening on that side. We as the readers can see what's going on in this man's life and how Allah propelled him and what's going on in the life of the father. And how he never lost hope. Allah has a similar plan for all of us. So constantly make dua. We were talking about what was the best time to make dua. All moments are moments for dua. But as soon as you've engaged in a good deed, it's also a good moment to make dua. You've read salah, make your dua. That is why even before salah is complete, there's a dua that we read in tashahud. Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, I have oppressed myself so greatly. You are the one who forgives. If you don't forgive, Ya Allah, we will be losers. Forgive us. That shows us forgiveness is also another important dua. And after salah, sunnah to make certain duas. Allahumma la mani alima a'atayt, wa la mu'atiya lima mana'at, wa la infa'udha al-jaddi minka al-jadd. That's in the hadith. Allahumma anta al-salam, wa minka al-salam, wa ilayka yarji'u al-salam. That's in Sahih al-Bukhari. Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. I need to translate that for you. Oh Allah, help me. Give me the ability to be able to remember you at every time. That's Allahumma in a'inni ala dhikrik. Oh Allah, help me to be able to remember you at every moment. Wa shukrik. Ya Allah, grant me the ability to be thankful to you. Wa husni ibadatik. And Ya Allah, grant me the ability to worship you in, the, in an acceptable manner. And to achieve that enjoyment through my worship of you. Sometimes we read salah, we take it as a burden. We gone from here, we came in only because we felt it was a duty and responsibility and we went out. That's if we came. 
But we should be such that we achieve so much pleasure from salah that we find it difficult to lift our heads up from sujood. That's how we should be. Now, we make dua to the Prophet, meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the Prophet did. Try and use his words. Before I get to the wording, let me mention a few more moments when du'as are accepted. Whilst the rain is falling, cool, calm rain, make du'a. Because the rahmah of Allah is descending, make du'a. When a calamity strikes, the malaika are saying, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Make a good du'a, not a bad one. When you, have, when you suddenly you have a big problem, make a du'a, a good du'a. When you're visiting the holy lands, holy places, sacred moments, what are the sacred moments? The time of tahajjud is a sacred moment. Sunrise, sunset, sacred moments. Maghrib, fajr, sacred moments. Friday, the whole day, sacred day, completely. Laylatul Qadr, Ramadan, sacred, sacred month. Make dua in the day and in the night. Time of iftar, make dua. When the adhan is going on, make dua. As soon as it's complete, make dua. These are times of dua. As soon as it's complete, make your du'as, what you want in life. Ask Allah. Repeat the same du'a again and again. There's no harm in having a list in your pocket of what you need. No harm. Take it out. Read it. Allah knows. People might laugh at you if they get to find out. So what? For as long as you get what you're asking for. Alhamdulillah. So we make du'a to Allah, but we're going wrong. If we haven't made a mistake here, we're making a mistake there. So these are the blessed moments. Then there are blessed words. Try to use broad words and try to make positive du'as. What's the meaning of that? Using broad words, the words that were used by the messengers. I've given an example before. I think even in Port Elizabeth, I've given this example in Ramadan. That the words that are used or were used by the messengers of Allah and they are mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah, they are words that were used and those du'as were accepted using those words. So if there is a key that has opened a certain lock, why do you want to try all other keys? Use the same key, it will open the lock. Allahu Akbar. And have yaqeen. But you need to know the meaning of the dua. A lot of us after salah, we say, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam. We have no clue what it means. No clue what it means. We've been uttering it. And I like to add one more thing that... A lot of us have been reading Salah for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. We don't even know the meaning of Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. We don't even know the meaning of Samia Allahu liman hamida. Rabbana lakal ham. We don't even know the meaning. Let me stop there for a moment. So, Samia Allahu liman hamida would mean that Allah has heard the one who praised him. Did we understand that? Immediately we say, I praise you, Ya Allah. Have you ever thought of that? Why do we say Rabbana lakal hamd? Because just before that we say Allah hears the one who praises him. So we say, Oh Allah, we praise you. Subhanallah. Look at how the two come hand in hand. Samia Allah liman hamida. You don't just say Allahu Akbar. Allah hears the, the one who praises him. So what do I need to do? If Allah hears the one who praises him, let me praise him. So I say Rabbana wa lakal hamd. Oh Allah, for you is all praise. Allahu Akbar. Now when you are saying this, you must think about it in salah. So Allah will hear me. But because we've been uttering it for 30, 40, 50 years, we never knew what it meant. We were just paying lip service. We know when you come up, Samia Allah liman hamida. Before you go down, Rabbana lakal hamd. Yes, the salah was fulfilled. But what did we achieve when we didn't know what it meant? It's never too late to learn. Never. Sometimes we don't know the meanings of the surahs. And Wallahi, we've been reading that surah for 30, 50 years. And then when it comes to Astaghfirullah, I don't like to give these examples, but I have to. When it comes to football, some of us showed interest in football after we were 50 years old, because it came to our country. Then we knew the names of the whole teams that we liked. But we didn't even know the meaning of Alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabil feel. One verse of the Quran is better than every football team in the world put together. And all the goals that were scored, and everything that happened, one verse of the Qur'an is better than all that put to it. A letter of the Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us guidance. Then, now there are three or four more aspects of dua remaining. I spoke about the words to be used. 
I spoke about the timings. There are blessed timings. But sometimes there's a blocker. What is the blocker? When we make a dua, and our dua is blocked, because we have wronged a fellow human. Because we have wronged a fellow human. So when you make a dua, make sure you, don't, you have not wronged others. You're saying, Ya Allah, give me happiness. But in your life, you're gossiping about everybody else. How are you going to get that happiness? You see, al-mani'ah. Mani means that thing which stops your dua from progressing because you are guilty of something which is the opposite of what you're asking for. You're asking for happiness, but you're making someone else's life difficult. This is why the narration teaches us that when you make dua for someone else, the angels say, Oh Allah, grant this person even better. So you say, Ya Allah, Buddha so and so, grant him goodness, Ya Allah, grant him happiness, give him sustenance. The angels are saying, Ya Allah, that person as well, give him goodness, give him happiness, give him contentment, subhanAllah. This is why the biggest test is for you to make dua for others, for others, for others, subhanAllah. It's a big test. The hadith says it, I told you whatever I'm saying is from Quran and Sunnah, inshaAllah. The hadith says it. One of the most accepted du'as are those du'as made for someone else without them knowing that you've even made the du'a, that you're even remembering them. Sometimes you can't even, you don't even know the person. Like for example, you're traveling, you find a Muslim brother riding a bicycle on the side of the highway or wherever on the side of the road. You say, Allah, make this man's life easy. And you carry it on. Wallahi, that could be the opening of all his doors. And if his doors were opened, you think yours are going to remain closed? Allahu Akbar, there you are. But it needed the genuine feeling for someone else. This is why it is sunnah for us to visit the sick. So many reasons. One of them is to say, Ya Allah, grant them good health. So we are not yet sick, but the angels are saying, Ya Allah, grant this person good health as well. Sometimes we have a sickness in us that we didn't know about. We will never know that we had cancer because Allah eradicated it before we were even tested for it. We will only find out in the akhirah. You know what happened to you? Let's inform you. Allahu Akbar. It could happen. Sometimes you'd never know that you, you had a condition that had you been tested upon that condition, you'd have been hospitalized. But because of the barakah of these du'as and the visits to the sick and the others, Allah has granted you total cure from that. Allahu Akbar. Or your dua every day. Allahumma inni as'aluka as-sihhata wal-iffata wal-amana. Oh Allah, grant me good health. Grant me iffa. Iffa is a very broad word. It includes protection from immorality and indecency. And it includes protection from wanting the wealth of others or needing it. And it includes so much. That is afaf and iffa. It, in, it has a broad meaning. And amana, oh Allah, grant me that amana. Ya Allah, that amana also has a broad meaning. In, in literal sense, it means the trust. Grant me the ability to be a good Muslim. That's what it includes. Grant me all forms of goodness. Make that dua every day. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to make duas that he never even feared. Or should I say, the, the sahaba never feared that he would suffer from that. But he made dua. Oh Allah. Now these are sunnah duas. Oh Allah, protect me from miserliness. He was the most generous. Oh Allah, protect me from shaitan. He was protected from shaitan. Oh Allah, protect me from misguiding other people. Allahu Akbar. Who's making this dua? The Prophet ﷺ go through that little booklet of duas called the fortress of a Muslim. Wallahi, you will be shocked at the type of duas that were made by the Prophet ﷺ. And that's only a small booklet. There are volumes and volumes of duas that he made. Then I was saying, we have a blocker. What is another type of a blocker? You make a dua, but you can't dress properly. You can't. Why? Here we're addressing the women folk. We ask for happiness, goodness, Ya Allah. My child needs to sleep at night, Ya Allah. But the whole day I'm moving around in a mini skirt. Astaghfirullah. Allah protect us. That doesn't work. If you have goodness at night for a moment, it's just a test. As I say, sometimes we don't deserve what we ask for, but Allah through His mercy still gives it to us. He says, don't worry, I'll still give it to you. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So we can't dress appropriately. Some of us, we can't leave our bad habits. Talk to the brothers. Some of us swear whole day. That's a block. You swear, it's a blocker between you and the dua you've made. Straight. It, your, your dua was about to be plugged in and suddenly there's an insulator coming in the middle. And now what's the point of plugging that thing in? 
It's not. It won't work. You're pulling the cord out. So no swearing, bad habits. Then, for example, we want to make dua to Allah, but our sustenance is haram. The hadith speaks about that. That a man calling out to us, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, wa malbasuhu haram, wa mashrabuhu haram, wa ghudhiya bil haram, fa anna yustajabu li dhadi. The hadith says, a person calling out to us, Oh my Rabb, my Rabb, my Rabb, crying tears, you created me, you made me, grant me. But his clothing is haram. Here we spoke about the covering of the hair. We speak about so many other things. Not only haram as in haram earned, but haram worn. We wear chains and big, big jewelry when we are men. When that's not allowed for us. Then we sing, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. Allah says, clothing haram, drinking haram. And he has been... He has been fed by haram. Ghuddiya bil haram. Ghuddiya means to be fed to the degree that your body was given nutrients through haram. Allah says, فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لِذَلِكَ How can such a person's dua be answered? So this means get into the right page. And then there is another issue that we need to address. And that is known as الاستعجال في الدعاء. The hadith says, يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ مَا لَمْ يَسْتَعْجِلْ All of your du'as will be granted for as long as you do not do isti'jal. What is the meaning of isti'jal? Isti'jal means to make haste. Now what do we mean by to make haste? So the sahaba asked him, مَا الْإِسْتِعْجَال? Ya Rasulullah, what is isti'jal? He says, أَنْ يَقُولَ To say, for someone to say, دَعَوْتُ Da'autu falam yustajabli. I called out to Allah. I made so much dua to Allah, but He hasn't yet answered me. Allah says, That is now insulting your Creator. That is now insulting your Creator. Why? The reason is, He knows when to give you, what to give you, and whether it is good for you or not. He knows it. How dare we say, I called out to Allah, but you know what? He doesn't want to give me. So many people say, I'm losing my iman. You ask them why? Because you know I've got this problem for 10 years. Well, Ayyub alayhi salam had the problem for longer than you. It made him a better person. Well, Nuh alayhi salam had a problem for longer than you. Zakaria alayhi salam had a problem for longer than you. It made them better people. They called out and so on. So, never ever say that Allah has not given me. And now I'm, I'm getting a bit fed up. Astaghfirullah. Those are bad words. Those are bad words. Remember when Allah knows something is bad for you. Sometimes we don't know. And this is a point that we need to drive home. You know, I've given this example and I want to repeat the same example. A young man makes a dua, Ya Allah, give me sustenance. I need to buy a GTI. A GTI, Ya Allah. I need to buy this vehicle that I need. You know, we're talking of vehicles close to Port Elizabeth. Don't worry. So, Ya Allah, I need to buy this GTI. Ya Allah. So he continues and continues and mashallah he tries this and, and he, that dua is the prime and the pride of his life. He forgets about hidayah and guidance and this and that and contentment and you know happy home and what, 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 so on. And he makes dua. And Allah knows it's not good for him. And he continues making dua. And Allah knows it's not good for him. And he continues making the dua. Ya Allah, this little you know, jalopy that I have here, Ya Allah, I, I need to change it. Ya Allah. If that's the main aim in life, you know what Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziya says in his book Al-Fawaid? He says, it's a beautiful Arabic statement. He says, Min al-afat al-khafiyya, al one of the hidden sicknesses of, of, that are very common. An yakun al-abdu fi ni'mati. That a worshipper is in such a beautiful situation, in a ni'mah. An yakun al-abdu fi ni'mati an'am Allahu biha alayhi. That Allah has blessed a worshipper with. فَيَمَلُّهَا So he becomes fed up with that gift. وَيَطْلُبُ الْإِنْتِقَالَ مِنْهَا إِلَى مَا يَزْعُمُ لِجَهْلِهِ أَنَّهُ خَيْرُ اللَّهُ مِنْهُ And he's asking Allah out of his ignorance to take him out of this gift and to take him to something that he thinks is a gift. But he doesn't pick up that what he had was a gift. So I'm giving you this example. And then Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziyya carries on to say, there comes a time when out of Allah's mercy, he says, okay, give my worshipper what he wants. And as soon as he gets it, he says, Ya Allah, take me back to what I had. Take me back to what I had. Ya Allah, it was better. It was better for me. But sometimes it can destroy him. Like I was speaking about this vehicle. If Allah knows that 
you look at the speedometer and you see, hey, 270, 280 there, and you try to push it up there. Next thing, the tire bursts and you're paralyzed for life. What happened? Better you didn't have that GTI. Agreed? Agreed? So that's why when Allah doesn't want it for you and keeps it with the lower spec of a vehicle, thank Allah. Say, Ya Allah, I want it if it's good for me. When it doesn't come, thank Allah. Ya Allah, I appreciate and I understand it's not good for me. That's why you haven't given it to me. Alhamdulillah. We fail in the last part. We fail in the last part. So this is also one of the issues we need to remember. Another issue. We need to realize when we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is in charge. Allah is in control. Allah will give us. And as I said moments ago, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask Him for what is good. And when we don't get it, we appreciate that that wasn't good for us. And at the same time, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that we are not allowed to make haste in dua. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to us how we want it if it is good for us. And if how we want it is not good for us, we need to know something else. Allah will replace it with what is better. That's another way of acceptance. So sometimes Allah replaces what you want. You ask Allah, Ya Allah, I need this. Imagine if you ask uh, your boss, you're working for a company, and you say, you know what, I need an upgrade, a vehicle upgrade, you know. I was driving a Polo, now I need a Corolla. And the boss comes and gives you a BM keys. He says, right, here's the latest BMW. How do you feel? Hey, you happy? Hey, I didn't ask for that. He says, well, I think you deserved it. That's an example of the dunya. So when we ask Allah with sincerity, and we don't become greedy in our dua, that's another thing. Don't become greedy. Ya Allah, I want goodness. All the business that's around here, all the people must only come to my place, Ya Allah. That's greed. If that is the case, and everybody must only come to your place, in that case, what about sustenance for others? They also need to live. So you say, Ya Allah, grant me barakah in my sustenance, and Ya Allah, grant the others barakah in theirs as well. What is pure and meant for you will come. And if all of them were meant to come, they will come. But we weren't greedy. That's the thing. We were, you see why? You know, I was reading about Bill Gates. They say he can live a life. I, now it must have increased. This was many years ago. He can live a life, his own life, with double the amount of luxuries he has. 650 times he can repeat that life of his from birth to death. And he will still have change. Right. This was a few years ago. Now it might be more. Now what does he need that for? Let's be honest. How long is he going to live for? Let's be frank. So the truth is, how much do I need? A million rands? A billion rands. Okay, let's set a figure. A billion rands. You clock a billion. Now what do you want? Allahu Akbar. The hadith is so correct to say man is so greedy. When he has a billion, he wants another. And he wants another. We are not saying it's greed to have 50 billion. If Allah wants to give it to you, he can give you 500 billion. No problem. The point is greed. Did you get it through greed? Or through the fadl of Allah. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, radiyallahu anhu, he was one of the most loaded of the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum. He was not greedy. He never said, give it to me, give it. You know, if you go back to his history, there was a time when he made hijrah, he had nil, he had nothing. He started business just like this. That day, he came back with Prophet. Allah blessed him. How do we save ourselves from greed? By giving, giving others. Giving out in sadaqat, khairat, charities, zakat, whatever. Give others. Don't worry. You live in your life. Allah will give you more. Another thing. You will, grant, you will get yourself more sustenance by pledging. What does, what does pledging mean? You tell a person, look, inshallah, if I am granted life and the ability, every month I'd like to give X amount to this cause. Inshallah. You don't have to sign it. But you made the true niya. In order to give those people, Allah will give you first. So that's a means of increasing your sustenance. The point I'm trying to raise is when we make dua, let's not be so greedy. Remember others as well and Allah will give you as well. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, rahmah, goodness. I think I've spoken of a lot of aspects of dua this evening. And I hope and pray that I've enlightened, firstly reminded myself, enlightened myself about this topic and then benefited all those who are here and those who may benefit from this later on. Uh, the topic of dua is a beautiful topic. We all need to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have not covered every aspect of this topic. There are still so many aspects remaining. If we take a look at the duas of the Quran, we will be amazed. 
I want to end off by ma mentioning one quick point. Let us never make negative du'as. What is a negative du'a? We are very fast in making du'a of destruction, du'a of curse, du'a of this and that. No, 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 no. Sometimes we deserve curse. We're making du'a for someone else's curse. They don't deserve it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all the prophets, they didn't make du'a for destruction for a long time. A long time. When I say long time, I mean they had patience. They all had patience. Nuh alayhi salam had patience for 950 years. Then he raised his hands. After that. So, when you have a problem with a brother or a sister, try out a new type of a dua. It's, it's new to us, but it's not new in the sharia. New to us meaning, your biggest enemy, make dua for his goodness. Ya Allah, grant him blessings, grant him barakah, grant him sustenance, grant him pious offspring. Subhanallah, are we ready to do that? Inshallah. When you see what happens to you. Ya Allah, grant him guidance. Ya Allah, make him, make me and him friends. Imagine, are we ready to do that? It's difficult, isn't it? But inshallah we are. عسى الله أن يجعل بينكم وبين الذين عاديتم منهم مودة والله قدير والله غفور رحيم Beautiful verses. Allah says Allah is able to create love between you and your biggest enemy because Allah is all able and capable. And Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. This verse was revealed the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, there were certain people who were big enemies of Islam. So, Rasulullah sallallahu was being taught and told that, you know, these people might become your biggest, biggest companions, the most solid for around you. Look at Khalid ibn al-Walid, subhanallah, radiallahu anhu. Look at Abu Sufyan, radiallahu anhu. Look at Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu. What happened? A split second, after he declared his shahada, from being the biggest enemy, he was the biggest server of the cause. What happened to Khalid ibn al-Walid? He was so worried that he came to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa He says, I am worried about what I did. I killed so many. I did this, I did that. I did this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Ya Khalid, inna al-Islam yajubbu ma qabla. Oh Khalid, Islam will delete whatever bad has happened in the past. Gone. Wiped. Khalid ibn al-Walid pledged that to the Prophet ﷺ. He became a lover of note. Radiyallahu anhu. And so many examples. With us as well. Allah, the hearts are in the hands of Allah. He creates enmity and friendship. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good communities. Solid bond. Based on deen. Not based on materialism. When we base our bond on materialism, it is bound to break the day the materialism lets us down. If you know someone and you're good to him only because he's, you know, you and him get on in business, one day you won't get on so you'll be bad to him. But if you're good to him because he's in the masjid and you are together and you are Muslimin and you give each other the lift, don't ask too many questions of private life, personal life and business and so on. Some people who are genuine friends, Wallahi, they don't know what their friends do in business for a long, long time. Because that wasn't the reason that they met. Nowadays, as soon as we meet people, brother, what's your business? What's your line? What do you do? Tell me. What happens? What's the detail? How you earn? How come you're driving these posh vehicles? What's happening? Ya, that got nothing to do with me. Nothing at all. Maybe I want a finger in the pie. Allah protect us. That's greed again. But my brother comes to the masjid. I meet him here. Smile at him. Greet him. And subhanallah, you met for the pleasure of Allah. You departed in the pleasure of Allah. You get the shade of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. رَجُلَانِ تَحَابَّا فِي اللَّهِ اِجْتَمَعَا عَلَيْهِ وَتَفَرَّقَا عَلَيْهِ The hadith says, those two who have met for the sake of Allah, they love each other for the sake of Allah, they meet for the pleasure of Allah, when they met they were in the pleasure of Allah, when they left they were in the pleasure of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will be granted the shade of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Qiyam. May Allah grant that to us. So these are certain factors regarding dua. We must all constantly make dua, as I said, positive dua, not negative dua. A lot of times we are guilty of saying, Ya Allah, destroy that man. Ya Allah, curse that man. Ya Allah, this woman, Ya Allah, destroy her. Ya Allah, that one day, destroy her. Ya Allah, break her. Ya Allah, that one day, her children, Ya Allah, fix them up. Ya Allah, that family, Ya Allah, break them. Wallahi, these are duas, criminalistic duas. They are not duas of a true mu'min with iman in the heart. 
No. How? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never ever made cursing du'as for other mu'mineen. No, he didn't. Not at all. And even when they made du'as against the kuffar, they made du'as of goodness. Allahumma a'izza al-Islam bi ahad al-umarain. Oh Allah, grant strength to Islam by the acceptance of Islam of either Abu Jahl or Umar ibn al-Khattab. Imagine Abu Jahl was the George Bush of that time. Yes, I'm giving you an example. But, but Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Ya Allah, give him guidance. Guide him. May Allah guide George Bush to deen. So that one day he can visit us in PE with a proper kufia and a beard. It can happen. Wallahi, don't be, don't underestimate the qudra of Allah, the power of Allah. I guarantee you, Islam is the only deen that makes sense in the globe. No other deen makes sense. It doesn't. We worship whoever created us and others worshipping everyone here and there. They're worshipping mediums, Jesus, may peace be upon him, being worshipped. But what guarantee do you have? No guarantee. That's a topic of its own or on its own. This is why they keep us far from the media. Because they know the moment these Muslims get a foot in the media, that's it. The world will convert. And guess what? It's a prediction of Rasulullah that people will turn into Islam in droves. Huge numbers. No matter what they try. Every negativity they try, positivity will come out of it. Subhanallah. September 11, after that, so many Muslims. 7-7, seven, seven, after that, so many Muslims. Banning of hijab, after that, countless Muslimat, women. Even the Muslim women went into hijab and niqab because Allah gave them guidance. Banning of the minaras, after that, how many masajid were built? How many people started coming to the masajid? You know, that's the point, it's not on our topic, but let me make mention of it. People are banning minaras across the globe, now they want to start. They, they already have one pilot project in Switzerland and because of, you know, they were studying its success and failure, they're going to modify it and implement it across the globe in many other countries. Our problem is, we want to fight and make, you know, present demonstrations and arguments about why it's powerful to have a minara and why we must, and why it's oppression to, and why it's wrong to destroy them. Where are we in the masjids? That's the question. We're fighting for a minara, yet we've never seen what the masjid looks like. We hardly go there. Besides on a Jumu'ah, if we're lucky, we'll arrive before the Imam gets up. If we're unlucky, sometimes we even miss that. So this is the double standards. If that's the case, we probably won't even have our du'as answered. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors and grant us every form of goodness. I was given a green light to speak for as long as I wanted. MashaAllah, the Imam is here, the people are here. I pray that whatever I have said comes inshallah from the heart straight to the heart. It was a topic I intended nothing besides the pleasure of Allah by speaking. And may Allah be pleased with myself and yourselves. Forgive me shortcomings and yourselves as well and grant us all Jannah. Allahumma salli ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala ala nabina Muhammadin wa barik wa sallim.